Recording has started. Okay, welcome to the July virtual interim of the W3C WebRTC Working Group. Just a reminder, this group abides by the W3C patent policy and only people and companies listed on the status webpage are allowed to make substantive contributions. So during this meeting, we're gonna be talking about some issues that have come up in WebRTC extensions and WebRTC SVC. We will also be discussing WebRTC ICE and the WebRTC NV use cases documents. So if you're here, you probably have the info on the meeting and these are links to the specs. Uh, do we have a scribe? someone to just take down the basic decisions of the meeting. I can do it. Okay, thank you, Eric. Okay, this meeting is being recorded. So here's what's on the agenda for today. Uh, we have WebRTC extensions, SVC, ICE, and then in the use cases. So I'm going to turn it over uh, to Florent. So right now we have um, some cast support using Get Receiver, and um, the codec selection for uh, the transmission is determined by uh, set codec preferences um, or whatever the defaults are in the client uh, to actually well, that's negotiated in the offer answer uh, but we're thinking of some use cases that where it would make sense to actually have different codecs on different layers um, for example as i mentioned uh, a low uh, low quality av1 and a higher resolution with VP8, VP9. Um, rationale is everyone will use less bytes. So if we can encode a small stream, even at low bit, uh, low frame rates, uh, we'll have a smaller bit rate. It might be easier for bad conditions. So if um, the connection allows it, maybe a VP9 will be transmitted as well, but for higher resolution. Um, another example of it could be to have um, hardware codecs and software codecs at the same time. Um, for example, you know the device supports uh, hardware x264, so you want to use that for some layer um, to make sure that there's something and if the resources allow it use um, another software codec where you have more control also about the quality. Uh, hardware codecs are notoriously um, tricky to use because you don't know necessarily the quality that you're going to get out of it or um, if you're going to um, give you the bitrate you ask for. So we had a similar mechanism previously um, from ORDC in um, coding parameters, we had a codec pedal type, which was uh, taken from the pedal types that you get from the offer answer. And that one uh, was removed from the spec uh, because there are some issues with it. Uh, you don't know it before you actually complete the negotiation, so you cannot use it. Uh, with a transceiver. Um, it was not defined that um, you could use codec pedal type to have uh, different um, codecs in a simulcast transmission, but I think it was implied that it would be a possibility. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, it was actually implemented in ORTC, but uh, as you say, ORTC didn't have that problem because you could choose the payload types. Right. 
So, so I'm suggesting a different solution that is similar to set codec preferences, uh, but at the simulcast layer level. So if you can go to the next slide, I have an example. Um, so here's a standard encodings, or just imagine encodings if it was a set parameters, uh, where you would have a new entry highlighted in green for the codecs, and you would say have um, codecs listed, for example, AV1, VP8, for different layers, and you could have different things there. Um, so that those codecs uh, entries are taken from the uh, standard Git capabilities call, just like set codec preferences. It's an array, and it's you you put preferences there. You could imagine that you put all the preferences you want before the offer answer, and they get uh, filtered after you the offer and answer is done to remaining codecs that are supported by the remote. Um, the, the shape of the API there is not quite defined, but it should work in a similar way. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, I have a summary of what I said. So uh, the codecs are taken from get capabilities call from the sender. Uh, you shouldn't be able to modify them just like in set codec preferences. Um, it doesn't have the issue that we have with uh, a transceiver. We don't where we wouldn't had to a pilot type before. And um, the a question that I got on the issue on GitHub was why don't you have two senders? And the reason for that is if you have simulcast, um, then you have resource allocation that is tied to simulcast, and so if you run out of resources, bandwidth, CPU, or whatever. You degrade uh, layers in a specific order that is defined in the spec, uh, which is not something that we can do right now with uh, different senders that, are, that have different codecs. So we would have a better resource allocation, bandwidth allocated between the two layers, uh, better uh, allocation for uh, uh, processing power, and it would allow a graceful degradation. So disable the higher layer first and then um, degrade the quality uh, as uh, needed on the different layers. Also something uh, that uh, this API could allow, um, not necessarily needed because I don't think that's a problem that people have uh, mentioned before, but that could allow also uh, switching uh, codec on a simulcast layer without going through another answer negotiation. You would just use set parameters. So some, a low power device joined to call can only do H264. Okay, let's move everyone down to H264. So that would be a possibility. That's not necessarily uh, uh, one of the main goal, but that's something that could be useful to some maybe. So that's all I prepared. Do you have any comments? Well, uh, considering the other endpoints already needs to be uh, prepared for any of the negotiated codex, this seems like a pretty harmless uh, change, unless uh, there's something I'm missing about. Yeah, it was contemplated in the original spec. It's just that the way it which was done didn't make sense. So. Any comments so, from Yanivar or the other people just to make sure we have like some agreement? Uh, yes. Uh, sorry, I arrived a little bit late. If you could resummarize, uh, I don't see any problems API-wise. I think uh, if you could resummarize the original problem for me, um, having different, allowing different codecs on uh, different simulcast layers to allow uh, proper degradation between the simulcast layer. If you run out of bandwidth, 
he would able the top layer, which is not something you can do right now if you have different senders with different codecs. Um, it would allow um, some use cases where would you would use a more complex codec at um, smaller sizes of simulcast to yeah have a better performance with um, bad network using less bandwidth, for example, yeah. with AV1 and uh, switch to a higher level, higher layers to a different codec that has maybe more features, more computationally intensive, but, but might be supported by the hardware, for example. So you will guarantee that something gets transmitted. And um, yeah, um, it's something that we would like to experiment with. We don't have any results about, oh, this improved um, the quality for users yeah. or anything. But uh, having that possibility in the API, at least to experiment right now, would be uh, something useful to us. Yeah. OK, it so would... you're considering this an, as an extension then? Uh, yes. Uh, right now, yeah. I suggest thinking to the WebRTC extensions. And I guess in the future, we might move things from the extensions to the main spec as if they're uh, widely implemented uh, or deemed very useful. Yeah. But right yeah. now, that would be an extension. Uh, I'm not sure how you would detect that uh, it's supported. Um, but try to set parameters uh, with some codecs. Read them back, see if the uh, uh, entry in the dictionary is still there. That could be a way to detect it, if it works. Uh, but yeah, that could be an extension um, that we would implement. Um, so I assume, of course, a... sorry, for detecting support, you uh, you would have to specify this in a transceiver first, and then you could read them back and see if you see the right. codex. For example, that, that could be a way, yes, yes, uh, to see if it works. In any case, uh, you should be able to send any of the codex that you have negotiated or any of the codex. That well, that is there. Yeah. So it's just a way to reprise or just get a subset of his codex. So, so I don't I think a, that would be a breaking change. I have a question about what happens on the wire. Like, what does the, what happens to the p-type of the RTP packets? If you're changing codex, normally you change the p-type. Um, on the RTP stream, you would have a different uh, payload type, uh, one right. that has been negotiated already uh, in the offer answer. Um, in the offer answer, you have all the different payload types, um, 86, 97, 98, um, for example. And uh, you would just start receiving um, an okay. RTP stream with different payload type, and then it should just be a similar thing as if you had uh, done an offer answer with a different codec preference, for example, I believe. Yeah, there, there, there are some, uh, th uh, we'd have to put in the, the checking, uh, uh, but to your question, Tim, I think you basically can't change the clock rate, although that wouldn't be something you would probably do no. in video, but you'd have to check that the clock rates were all the same for these. Yeah, you would have to check that all the codec entries are the same as the ones that are returned by uh, get capabilities uh, right. in the same way that it's done with psychotic uh, preferences. So you cannot change any parameters. You cannot change FMTP parameters or anything. Um, if um, you have SVC uh, modes listed, you would put them the same way, um, probably. Just copy the exact codec uh, entry uh, without any changes. So just like set codec preferences. Okay. So is there interest in seeing this PR and extensions? It seems particularly useful given that AV1 is coming into uh, WebRTC. And I think that's is a classic use of AV1, at least in, you know, in the beginning when it can't necessarily do everything. I say go for it. I think this would even be uh, compatible with uh, uh, clients that don't support this because they're already prepared for this product right. changing. Right. You can you can fake this by doing a little uh, offer answer dance on the sender side, but you don't tell the receiver side. Yeah. It's just that today this would uh, happen to all layers, but I don't see why it couldn't happen for 
uh, different payload types and different layers should work. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I think there's interest in it. All right, okay. so next issue is from WebRTC SVC. Um, this issue was brought up by Dr. Alex, who is also working on AV1. Uh, and the question came up because of some unique capabilities of AV1. Um, and we'll get into that in a bit. In a bit. So today, WebRTC PC supports the negotiation of multi-stream simulcast. Uh, and basically, the uh, an SFU, for example, can send the offer indicating how many streams it can receive. Um, and then uh, the browser can answer. Um, now, it turns out that AV1 has can do simulcast transport in a different way, which is it can send multiple simulcast encodings on a single RTP stream. Uh, and support for this is being implemented as we speak. Um, this is a little weird because within SDP and, uh, and wherever you see, you only negotiate really the number of streams. We, we call it encoding parameters, but it's, it's really only related to streams. Um, and so if you have multiple encodings on a single stream, it doesn't really show up in encoding parameters, um, except for the what we call the scalability mode, which is in WebRTC SVC. So you basic, what happens is you don't negotiate multiple stream simulcast, you just set it in either set parameters or add transceiver. So uh, in the process of writing the test cases to figure out if AV1 worked and, and potentially would interoperate between browsers, Dr. Alex came up with the following question. Is it legal to have mixed simulcast transport? So as an example, uh, you could have three encodings, uh, three, three layers, uh, such as what Florent described. And then within each of them, you could have three simulcast layers. So you'd have nine encodings in this kind of hierarchical manner. Um, so I have a question for the working group. Does anyone see a reason why you would want to have mixed simulcast transports, do both things at once? What's the benefit of, uh, bundling multiple layers in a single stream? Uh, no one I know could think of a benefit, but. Right. <laughs> so the idea was nobody could think about a use case that would generate that. But if you thorough and you try all the possible scenario that would be compliant, that is one of them. And so I was raising that up saying, I think we should prevent people from doing that. That's, that's not the right way to do things. Um, and if that's the, the, the answer from the group, then we should explicitly do something about it in the spec. Right. So what we expect is that nobody want that to happen, even though with the current state of the specification, that would be legal to do. I guess it doesn't really make sense to do that. Um, but I don't see why we should necessarily prevent it. Um, if people want to experiment with those things, they maybe could. But, um, but if, if our libraries are generic enough, it should just work. Um, maybe not going to be very performant right now with uh, the hardware we have, but um, yeah, if people want to so, do it, they, they could, but why? I don't have an answer for that. So um, we've developed a PR, and uh, let me kind of go through it, and we can, we can uh, talk about... Uh, any potential modifications. So um, the PR basically, uh, and this is kind of implicit, but it, uh, browsers may or may not support single stream simulcast, sending sing, sing, single stream simulcast, and SFUs may or may not support receiving it, right? So it's an optional capability. Um, we uh, Browsers today can't receive multiple stream simulcast, and we don't think though it makes any sense to receive single stream simulcast either. Uh, and in fact, right, Dr. Alex, it'll always be filtered, uh, well, it would always be filtered in an SFU, but I think there are also gonna be problems in, uh, well, in just receiving it, deciding which operating point, right, Dr. Alex? I think that's true. Yeah, I, I think, um, 
what I'm afraid of, you know, Florian, you say let let people experiment with this, but if you let people do try everything with expectation that it's going to give a certain result and it does not, they're going to come back to us and say that thing is broken, right? Um, so I'm 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 a little bit careful about putting this. I think it's it's a real nightmare to use. Most of the time, simul cache stories we see is used on the sender side to do adaptation. If you mix the single source and the multiple source, you start having problem with the bandwidth estimation, the congestion control to start with. And then the SFU implementation is, is completely crazy. Right. Yeah. So a reasonable approach is to say the, the only one that does um, single stream multicast um, uh, simulcast today is AV1 anyway, right? right? And people are going to have an AV1 stream of uh, a specific RTP payload filtering system on the SFU, which is what Bernard uh, spoke about the decoding target and things like that. Uh, I think we should on mix. I think what Florence said, having a high resolution stream with, uh, with AV1 and a low resolution stream with H.264 is a good case. But for example, Nobody will go one step further and say, oh, and by the way, the high resolution is intrinsically multi-layered as well, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, so anyway, so this PR proposes uh, a, an operation error if you attempt to do this. So basically, you look at your encodings. If there's, if there's multiple layers and there's an S mode, uh, the proposal in this PR is to have an operation error, and that would be for either set parameters. Or a transceiver, so it's it would be illegal. Um, the other reason um, I, to I yeah. have a uh, comment on that. What about if you were switching from regular simulcast to um, the single stream simulcast and disabling the other layers? You would have effectively multiple layers negotiated and a simulcast mode in some layer. That's correct. We we think that case is not going to be dynamic. We think at the beginning, people would decide either to go multi-stream simulcast possible with different codec for each of the stream, right? Or choose AV1 and, and use the intrinsic SVC capacity of AV1 for all the layers. And in which case, they should just go for all the modes the, that are defined within the AV1 single stream simulcast. Yeah. So um, the other reason to... Uh, uh, we had a question, I think, that also came up, uh, and this was more in the in the AV1 group. But how do you know whether an SFU supports single stream simulcast? Right, uh, not every SFU probably will support it. Um, and then, how do you know how many encodings it can handle? Uh, in the multiple stream case, we know this because you can negotiate it and offer answer. But the question was for the single stream case: How do you know it? So basically, uh, one way to know it is using get capabilities. So. As an example, and it works either in a browser or an SFU, if you do get the capabilities of the receiver um, and you see S modes in there, it means that uh, that SFU is capable of receiving this single stream simulcast mode. Uh, so as an example, if you had see, saw the S2T1 and S2T1H modes, but no other S modes, that would mean the SFU can support uh, two simulcast encodings on a single stream, but no more than that. So basically, we have a way, uh, and this is obviously outside of offer answer. But if you exchange, uh, if you if the SFU sends its capabilities before you do add transceiver and offer answer, uh, you can know whether it supports these single stream modes and know know whether to set the single stream uh, simulcast or do the the regular uh, multiple SSRC. To be, to be thorough here, the L1T2 and L1T3 are used for VP8 and H.264 mix mode, where you simulcast the spatial layer, but each of the spatial layer has multiple um, temporal layers. Right, right now, in, in, in the WebRTC implementation, when you do simulcast with VP8 or H.264, um, you automatically get also switch on loose modes, right? With other two or three uh, um, special layer. Yeah, I'm not sure it works with H.264 anymore because just frame marking was removed, but uh, yeah, it does um, work with VP8, VP9. I find it odd to talk about uh, the WebRTC APIs running on a SFU directly because you would have to run um, the get capacity call 
capabilities call on the SFU, which means we would need to say that we can actually receive some cast there and probably have some kind of support. Well, so right, uh, Florent, um, the, the SFU don't have to implement the JavaScript API, right. but it's written in the spec of the WebRTC JavaScript API in the simulcast section that the use case of simulcast is send a site to SFU, right? So yeah, specifically, yeah. the word SFU is in the spec. So here is not normative, it's more informative. You say, by the way, guys, how do we signal that uh, two peers, and because it's simulcast, one of them is going to be an SFU implementation, have the capacity to support uh, a, a specific layer. We don't have the equivalent of the simulcast, so there is no RID and there is nothing in the SDP today that allow to do that. And we just point people to the fact that uh, by probing on the broader side, uh, RTP receiver get, get capabilities and filtering for those modes, that gives you the answer to your question. And you can do the equivalent on a non-browser side of the implementation of WebRTC and the signaling and then up to whatever signaling you will have to adopt, but it's not going to be part of the SDP offer answer. Yeah, and the key thing to understand here is, is this, uh, one of the reasons for getting rid of these complex mixtures is this kind of a scheme would not work for for that complex mixture. For example, you know, uh, if you could mix them, the SFU might might have to say something like, "I can handle up to eight streams with you know four of them, two 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 uh, layers, and then four in a in a given one." And that that kind of uh, capability is very difficult to figure out and signal. Uh, whereas this is very, very simple. It's, hey, I support these S modes or I don't. Um, and it, it tells you exactly what you can send. So that's a, that's another uh, another but reason, I think, not if, to do the, the mixture. If we simply don't support this, then all of this becomes a non-issue, right? Don't support yeah, let's not support web I think the job is done. <laughs> is, is there really anything to support i mean for me this is a property of the application that is querying their sfu and asking in a proper way possibly what modes do you support so then it seems logical that the current client uh, will not use any of the modes that is reported supported by the application i don't see why that necessarily needs to be uh, discussed in the spec. Well, the other alternative, which has been proposed, if we don't do this, um, you'll actually have an SDP proposal coming and that you'll have to support in WebRTC. see. So it'll, it'll, you know, there's, you'll have a very, very complex, you know, 20 or 30 page SDP proposal. So that's the alternative but to this. If we don't have a use case, why no, the use time. case exists? The use case exists, and it's the RTP payload spec for v one, and the RTP payload spec for v one um, lists all those modes that cannot be implemented or supported in reality in a, in a full system without that kind of thing. And then another one, which is the WebRTC SVC spec by Bernard, that also lists and is more generic than v one, right? It also lists what is possible with VP nine and what is done with VP eight and H two six four today. Um, so if we want to support AV1 and the corresponding RTP payload, we have to address this question. So uh, from what I hear from Google, this is something they want. Yeah, there's no, uh, yeah, so far we haven't heard uh, an interest in this uh, multiple mode thing. And as I've described here, it's it would be quite complicated uh, and you'd have to go down the STP route and have a very, very complex STP negotiation to get to get this done. If we if we feel we need to support these mixed, and, and uh, that's only for right. certain modes and not others, right? Uh, yeah, it's for uh, again. If your use case was that specific mix use case, then uh, right. then you are correct. We do not know of any people that would want to do that. But since it's permitted by the by the spec, we just. Uh, trying to avoid having people even trying, right? Because yeah. the support of that use case will be overly complex. Uh, my suggestion would be to prevent it. And once someone comes up with a need for it, then we can rediscuss it. But at this point, if it's complex and not needed, then let's just 
go ahead with forbidding it. Yeah, I mean, it's to be clear, we would be forbidding it in WebRTC. Uh, we wouldn't. It's not forbidden in the AV1 codex oh, spec, and you know, you can still use library AOM to generate it. But in, in WebRTC, we wouldn't be allowing it. Yeah. I just wanted to like, I'm I'm in favor of this, and uh, I just wanted to kind of say, I want to be careful about saying it's always be done in an SFU. I think there are use cases where endpoints mm -hmm. might want to do this. I mean, not the mixed mode, but in general, um, pick out single streams of simulcast. Um, mm -hmm. Like, you know, you think about security recording devices. You might record a different stream than you show, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So um, I, I just kind of, can we say SFU or similar? So just like yeah. pluralize it somehow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK. So uh, moving on to WebRTC ICE. Um, we have a special guest with us today. Peter, are you here? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, so back. just a little, uh, a little reminder about where we are with WebRTC ICE. We have an editor's draft, 13 open issues. Uh, this has been widely implemented. It's there are four implementations of it, only one of which has forking today. Uh, actually, maybe there's uh, yeah, that's uh, maybe more implementations. Anyway, the functionality is basically a standalone ICE transport with no SDP dependency. Um, there is an issue open for adding forking support. I would mention there's also WebRTC.org bug for forking support and an unmerged PR uh, that. I believe supports uh, forking. Um, I'd like to tie this back to WebRTC NB use cases. So as it is, what's in WebRTC ICE supports a use case uh, such as data channel on workers. I would note that data channel workers is not a use case in WebRTC NB uh, use cases, but it is something we've had requests for, and in particular, someone filed an issue in WebRTC uh, recently, 2553, asking for this. Um, WebRTC ICE as it exists currently does not meet requirements for the multi-party online game, which is in WebRTC uh, and the use cases, because that case requires forking. Uh, it doesn't support the calling with multiple endpoint case, because that also requires forking. There's mobility uh, use case in the NB use cases, which requires flex ICE. I don't think that one doesn't mention forking. Um, and then we've discussed at various points peer-to-peer -peer mesh use cases, such as a TPAC 2019, that also requires flex ice. So we're in a little bit of an interesting uh, dilemma here because we have this spec, but it doesn't actually support any of the any use cases in WebRTC NV uh, use cases document. Um, and so we've been trying to figure out what we need to do, what we need to add to the spec to at least support uh, some use cases uh, that are that we've said we want to support. Um, so a little bit of reminder about FlexIce. FlexIce has a lot of features, uh, of which forking is only one, but there's a lot of uh, ways to control where the paths and things like that. Um, and we did we discussed that at TPAC 2019. So I'd like to uh, hand it over to our esteemed guest, uh, Peter Thatcher. Thanks. Nice to see everybody again. Um, to go back to your slide, can you go back one slide, Bernard? One more, sorry. Uh, on the bottom, it says peer-to-peer -peer mesh use case requires flex ice. I don't know if you meant to mention forking there also, or if. Oh, okay. So it does also the mesh case also requires forking. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. And that was something I was going to mention uh, in my slides, but okay. Please go back to the, the slides I made. All right. So next slide. So this is the, the main slide um, at T from that I had at TPAC 2019. And uh, basically, it was the three things that the peer-to-peer -peer mesh case needed, which is the main one I talked about at TPAC 2019. Next slide. And the big question was this one, which is, are we willing to implement ice forking? Next slide which is really a question of how hard it is to implement. So after TPAC 2019, uh, I went and 
investigated how hard it would be to implement ice forking, um, and it wasn't that bad. It was a lot easier than I expected. Next slide. Oh, I blew it. I was going to give you a drum roll. All right, next slide. <laughs> drum roll. Next slide. Uh, it's not that hard. So this is how I kind of felt when I finally realized how much code needed to change, and it wasn't nearly as much uh, as I thought it would be. I was pretty happy about that. And uh, next slide. That kind of led to the question of, OK, um, why do we want this? And a little bit of history on this was, uh, while I was at Google, I made a CL for LibWebRTC that was a kind of proof of concept that this could be implemented. But it didn't have really a decent API, and it just had some unit tests. It wasn't kind of proven that it would work for call forking. Um, and then later, when I came to Signal, um, it turned out that ice forking would be useful, which is what I'll talk about later. Um, and once I updated the CL to actually be useful in a real world context, and when I went back to um, LibWebRTC and provided it upstream uh, as a as a CL, um, Harold was asking basically, you know, what, what's the interest level on this? So we answered the question of how hard it is to implement, and now that punts us back to the question of how useful is it. So that's that's what we've discussed, or what I want to discuss now. Next slide. Uh, we already know about the peer-to-peer -peer mesh case. Uh, we, we talked about that at 2019. So now I want to talk about a different one, which is call forking. Next slide. Um, so a little background on call forking, unless you, in case you don't know what it is, it's basically when you want one device to call multiple devices. And there are multiple ways of doing this, uh, but ice forking can be a particularly good, a particularly good one, and I'll explain why. Next slide. And it's a little funny because the original use case for call, for ice forking back in the ORTC days was call forking. So the fact that we're discussing this is a little bit of going back to the future. Next slide. Uh, right. So why do you need ice forking for call forking? And you don't need it exactly, but if you want it to be fast and efficient, you need it. So I'll explain why. Next slide. For example, you could say, Peter, why don't we just wait to do ICE? You know, send out multiple offers, wait for one particular answer, and then do ICE after that. Well, it makes the call setup slower. Um, it's nice to be able to do ICE while the various callees are ringing um, so that when one of them answers, it's a lot faster. So if you say wait to do ICE, you're just going to have slower call setup. Next slide. So that's out. Um, you could say, why don't you send out an offer? So if, for example, you knew ahead of time that you were going to talk to five different colleagues, you could create an offer five different times, five different offers, allocate five different sets of candidates, um, send out all those candidates five times, and so on. And that would work. The problem is that, A, you need to know how many there are, um, which not all systems do. Um, and maybe that puts limits on how big of any you can have. Second, you need to allocate lots of ICE candidates, um, which might put extra strain on your turn um, ports. And another is that you have to send out more candidates over signaling, and um, that can actually be an issue. So basically, everything multiplies by n on top of needing to know what n is. So for um, this doesn't help with efficiency, and for some situations where you wouldn't know it in the first place, it's kind of a non-starter. So at least for Signal's use case, this was kind of um, suboptimal or had uh, difficulties. So eh, next slide. <laughs> so um, if we decide, yes, ice forking is definitely the way to go with call forking, which is what we decided at Signal. Uh, the question is, can this even work for peer con the peer connection API? And uh, so I'm using this little emoji as the representation of the peer connection. Because um, it's, yeah, I just thought it was cute. All right, next slide. And the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, 
not only can we fork ICE, but we can kind of fork peer connections. Um, and it, the API, an API for doing so is not that difficult. Uh, I was originally worried that it might be, but it turns out it's not that bad. So next slide. Now, uh, I was told that since uh, Signal is not part of the W3C, that I should be careful to explain the what and the why, but not the how. So instead of proposing any particular API, I'm simply going to give the requirements for what is needed in an API um, that would allow for call forking with the peer connection API with ICE forking underneath. Uh, and there are basically three parts. One is that you need to create an offer that can be shared between several different peer connections. And second, you need to gather candidates that can be shared among several peer connections. And then the, the key part is that you take the first two and you apply them to a newly created peer connection. Now, what the mechanism is for creating these shared offers and candidates it could be many different things, uh, but the key is just that when you apply it to different peer connections, all those peer, conne peer connections end up sharing the same local description and the same localized candidates. So next slide. Uh, so this is kind of the summary where ice forking leads to fast call forking. And then I think I have one more slide. Oh yeah, it's mind blowing. <laughs> uh, next slide. I think there's one more. Okay, yeah, it's a conclusion. Uh, so the update is that ice fork is implementable, it's not that bad. Uh, that doing call and ice forking is compatible with the peer connection API, it's not that bad. And that adding these to the API allows for apps like Signal to do fast and efficient multi-ring or call forking. And uh, a little bit of a fourth point, I mean, it's smaller though, because it's not quite as important. Um, the API I presented at TPAC 2019, I think was perhaps a little too complex and after more um, real world work on this, um, there's a simpler way. Uh, I can't say what it is, but I'll just point out that there is a simpler way. And uh, as far as Signal goes, we have uh, put this code into production. Uh, so we're reasonably confident that it works. Uh, so it's not just theoretical. It's like all of this stuff can work in the real world and if we put it, if it's put into the browser, uh, it might be of use to apps like Signal in a web context. So that's what I got. So Peter, when, when you say it's already shipping, you mean in your native app, right? Correct. Thanks. Um, so uh, there are a couple of questions for the working group. Um, and I guess the first one relates to use cases. Um, we have a couple of use cases that requires forking, but not nothing as basic as just a call forking use case. Uh, so one question is whether we should add that to the use cases document. Um, and the second is whether uh, there is consensus to add uh, through some mechanism to add forking support I guess the first question is, would we add it to WebRTC ICE or to WebRTC extensions or both? Oh, I'm a little bit, uh, if you can clarify, confused about what happens when you do the ICE forking, right? So you have a, you fork the peer connection, but you still need to connect to a new endpoint. So, so what's the what's the thing you, you benefit that, what's the difference between basically starting a new peer connection and then getting the new candidates, because you need the new candidates for the new, whatever the new endpoint is, right? Uh, you have new, you have distinct remote candidates for every right. remote device, yes. And so those are paired with shared local candidates. So you end up with different pairs, but all the pairs share local candidates. Okay. So does that mean you end up with basically fewer open ports on the end that's doing this? Yes. Okay. So are there any security ramifications of reusing the same offer? 
Uh, it does require using the same remote or so the same uh, local certificate. So yeah, so yeah, forking has implications for higher layers. So as an example, uh, when we discovered this and we did ORTC, uh, initially we didn't appreciate the fact that you had to basically offer the same, the DTLS certs had to be essentially the same in, in both offers. Does that mean the peer connections, uh, peer connections share the transport objects as well? No. 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 Uh, all the transport objects are distinct. The only, yep. if, yeah. if you made something that was shared, it would be a new object of some sort. Yeah, just, just to clarify, I understand the high level. So if, if you basically fork or clone a peer connection in this way, <clears throat> we're not talking they're still going to set up individual connections that are totally separate in every other way, correct? Yes, everything is unique and separate, except that the local um, candidates are the same, they're shared, and the local offer. And because the local offer is shared, you also would have the same um, certificate and uh, RTP parameters, like SSRCs and payload types. Is that where the benefit comes in that the certificate is known beforehand and you don't have to exchange a new one? No, there's not really any benefit to having a shared certificate other than, um, you know, you don't have to generate N certificates, you only generate one. But yeah. with ECE DSA, that's not. Yeah, it doesn't save you any like negotiation steps or anything like that. I don't, I don't actually understand for the moment why you have to have the same certificate um I well because you're, the whole idea is you're sending an offer and you're getting back n answers right because that offer goes to everybody the certificate can't be different like the fingerprint has to be the same because it's in one offer going to n people yeah that, that's an stp you attribute rather than anything about uh, no, no, it, it occurred in OHC, which has no SDP either, because you're you're making an offer. It doesn't have to be an SDP offer; it could be a JSON offer. It, but you're offering the same thing to everybody. So, yeah, I mean, you could envision a different model where you're just sharing the ICE candidates and not well, and the UFRAG and password, uh, right. but you're not sharing the rest of the the offer. Um, and in that case, you would still need to send indistinct offers and need to know N ahead of time, but you would not have to allocate so many candidates. So you get like half the benefit. Um, but I, I haven't explored that. So I, I don't have any real world experience with trying to attempt that version of um, forking. So I, I guess what I'm trying to understand from the working group is, is this are we adding forking support? Should we add it to WebRTC extensions, which would make it applicable to peer connection, or just to WebRTC ICE in the standalone case, or both? I guess, Peter, you're advocating for WebRTC extensions, right? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> Does it matter? What's the, so what's you, don't, the you don't do stand, in Signal, you don't do the standalone ICE thing, right? Uh, correct. Okay. We're so using the peer connection API. So yeah, if, if you're trying to decide what level of the API to do, um, I think that it would be easier for existing applications to have it in WebRTC extensions. Although um, in general, I've always been more of a fan of lower level APIs. Uh, in this case, I think it is easier to deal with, with uh, a higher level one. Yeah, because you're doing call forking. The use cases we've had before were the things like data channel and workers, which didn't need to go. All, it didn't need to have all of your connection. So, um, other opinions on the call forking use case? As Peter said, it's very old, but we it it isn't in whatever to see the use cases today. Um, so. What happens with things like 
this is all an optimization of call setup. Mm -hmm. so once you have a connection, are there any implications of, uh, you know, what if you do an ICE restart, that everything is separate at that point? Or are there remnants of this, this optimization? No, it's basically free from uh, its history at that point. Um, okay. Because it has a new set of candidates and a new UFRAG and password. Right. Uh, any any direction or opinions on the on the issue of uh, of Weber C ice versus Weber C extensions? Uh, I mean, yeah. to, go ahead. Yeah, my, my sense is that we should first see the use case uh, documented so that we get the clear list of uh, requirements. I mean, I, I think. We already got that high level picture in the presentation, but having it in the NV use case document would uh, help further discussion on this. Um, uh, and I'm unclear about what it implies, if anything, to have it in both. I mean, technically, I think once you implement it for one, having it in the other shouldn't be that much. Well, more. here's. Here's where the issue comes up, uh, Dom. So uh, we've had this bug filed against WebRTC, which was for the uh, data channel and workers. Right. And uh, we had previously discussed that in TPACs, and that was one of the reasons we went to the standalone ISIS, because we felt we didn't want to have uh, all of peer connection and workers. Um, but this bug that was filed, basically people said that was what they wanted. They wanted all a peer connection in the worker, not just to the data channel and ICE. So um, I think we've had a little bit of, of uh, confusion about these use cases, about whether we were trying to extend peer connection or build kind of a standalone, go the standalone route. Um, the, call, the nice thing about the call forking use cases, it's pretty clear Unless you're going to build an entire OTC stack, you pretty much have to do that uh, with WebRTC extensions. So if we put that use case in, it basically means we're going to uh, kind of go down the route of, of uh, adding forking to peer connection. Um, and then the next question would be, you know, is it possible to do uh, data channel networkers within peer connection? Right, uh, and that, that's why I'm saying let's get the use case formalized uh, and see if there is indeed interest in adopting it because if there is then i think the question of the pc extension uh is solved you you need it, <laughs> um, right, you need it. okay all right um so i think that's the first case we'll do uh we'll add the forking use case and i think that implies a pr to one of the above but we don't know Quite yet, I think maybe discussion of the of the data channel uh, in workers will help clarify it. So I have a really dumb question, maybe. But what happens today if you take an offer, send it to many, and they all apply, or or, or you apply the same remote offer to multiple peer connections locally? I mean, what is the actual change needed for this? I'm assuming it doesn't work today, or or. There wouldn't be a peer. Or you wouldn't be able to apply the, the answers from N people, right? You could but, create uh, N peer connections. And then with SDP munching, maybe you can get the same setup for all of them, even though it's. Where you'd be, as Peter said, you'd be, you'd be gathering. Right, you'd be gathering again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. OK. Thank you. I think we've got our the answers, uh, rough answers for going forward. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you for having me. Um, so I wanted to talk with the remaining time. I wanted to go over where we are with MV use cases, um, and also introduce uh, potential web transport use cases. Um, 
and then ask the question about whether we've missed any use cases. I think uh, there might be some stuff out there we might want to talk about. So a little bit of a summary of where we are with NB use cases. We have some improvements to existing use cases, uh, like multi-party online games, mobility, scalable video conferencing, um, and some improvements to natural stuff like that. Um, and then we have new use cases. Currently, file sharing, Internet of Things, funny hats, machine learning, virtual reality gaming, and secure video conferencing. So that's what's in our NB use cases so far. Um, we've had various additions that have been suggested and discussed. Uh, we've had recent discussion about uh, security, and that would be the trusted JavaScript use case, which we removed from the document. And then we've been talking about a semi-trusted case. I think UN is on the hook for that, although we need to define what semi-trusted is. As I mentioned, we had a bug filed, uh, which we'll probably move to over to CNV repo about data channel and workers. Uh, we've had the peer-to-peer -peer mesh cases that Peter talked about. Uh, and we've also had three bugs that I'll be, uh, three new uh, potential use cases people have been asking for, a broadcasting use case, a censorship circumvention, and then uh, one which involves more control over latency and acceptable loss. So I'll talk about these three. Um, now, uh, as you may know, the W3C is looking at creating a web transport working group. And as part of their charter, they also list a use case document. Um, and uh, it doesn't exist yet, but there were some use cases discussed at the IETF 106 Web Transport BOF that included also some new and some existing use cases. The new ones were machine learning in a client server mode. So uh, you were sending um, mach machine learning in the cloud, uh, cloud gaming, and then live streaming, which would be something like a live event, a sporting event, with a, maybe with a chat or something. Um, and then there were some existing use cases, which would be a remote virtual desktop, again, client server scenario, and then two, which were web games and uh, web chat. Not sure we know what those are yet, but uh, so this is, this is the realm of the web transport use cases. Um, so keeping that in mind, here is uh, the issue 50, which related to broadcasting of one to many. Um, and uh, so this is a situation where developers are trying to broadcast at large scale. Um, and uh, the issue mentions three things. One is uh, the negotiation of the cipher suites. I think we've discussed this in an, uh, uh, separately. Um, and then uh, having to do various machinations. It's inherently a client server use case, I think. But uh, apparently, people are trying to use ICE over TCP. Um, and then another thing, which I've actually heard, is a request for DRM, which whoever you see doesn't support. Um, so uh, in looking at this, there are a couple of things that came to mind, one of which is that um, if you're doing client server and using the MSE path, media source extensions, you actually do get DRM. Um, so. Uh, which you don't get in WebRTC. So a big question was, is this really a WebRTC use case or is it a web transport use case? Um, and if you're if it's client server, it's not clear why you need ICE at all, let alone ICE over TCP. Um, and uh, probably might be a little less complex if you use web transport. So uh, in looking at this use case, it seemed to me this wasn't actually a WebRTC NB use case, but really a web transport use case. And so uh, when the web transport working group gets formed, I assume they'll have some kind of repo uh, for use cases. And my proposal is to transfer this use case there. Any objections? Sounds good to me. OK. So the second one is censorship circumvention. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with Snowflake, uh, but apparently people are doing things like that. And also, somebody's running WireGuard VPN over the data channel. Not sure how you do that. But uh, it's this is a situation where people have an extreme need for uh, uh, privacy. Uh, and people are concerned about things like safeguarding information from ICE, like they don't want to have the UFRAG and password be seen on the wire, uh, or from the DTLS handshake, which can expose self-signed certs uh, and allow identification. 
Um, so then the question is, how do you fix that? And uh, kind of in looking at this, uh, it's hard uh, to see. Well, first of all, it's a VPN. We're talking about a VPN, which is, seems like an inherently client server kind of thing. Um, if, if it's a VPN as we know it and uh, we normally talk about it, it's, it's something you open from a client to server. That has been proposed for use in QUIC. There's an ITF mask working group, which is looking at stuff like that, QUIC uh, VPNs. Um, the other thing is that when you think about ICE, um, you kind of have to expose the UFRAG and, and uh, password. Um, but if you don't do ICE, obviously you don't have to expose that. And then the other thing is that QUIC actually hides a lot more information, like the certificate is not sent in the clear and quick, uh, I guess because of TLS 1.3, uh, whereas DTLS down level versions would send that and there's really no way to avoid it. Um, so this seems like it also might be a web transport use case rather than a WebRTC NV use case. I feel like there's a kind of running theme here that, that we're assuming that WebRTC is client server and agree the bulk use cases are but I think some of the interesting ones aren't so I kind of worry that um, I don't know that we're maybe dodging these potentially interesting problems um, unnecessarily maybe well how would you I mean how would you hide the ice negotiation I mean, well, you can, you maybe, can you already, maybe you already know it. Like you, you, you must. Presumably, there must be some shared information you could derive. You could write some rules about how you derive a UFRAG and um, a, a U password from some shared secret or some shared state, and just not have to send it over the wire. Well, but then that doesn't require any change to the API. I believe you can already do that. You can share. Signaling out of band. but but we're not talking about the API. We're talking about do we want to move this whole use case out to somebody else's use case space? Mm -hmm. I'm saying it's a perfectly fair use case to have here potentially. Um, <clears throat> I mean, whether there's any interest in it is a whole other. Like yeah, that's I, a I maybe in a minority of one here that I think it's interesting. But there you go, and I don't get a vote either. So. <laughs> Well, <clears throat> I guess the question is, is there something meaningf meaningful we could do here for WebRTC to solve this? I think Bernard's question was, how would we protect that information without, except for the case where you have the information already, which doesn't seem like a computing problem as much. No, but but I think the role of standards would be to to codify how you derive them. Like if you had some shared information that you could then use to derive the U, the U password from. Like, what were the rules for doing that? It's the kind of thing that you could do in, in a standard space. I mean, I'm kind of making this up on the hoof, so it's probably completely like, well, ill thought yeah. through. But The thing is that in any of the APIs we've done in the W3C, you can't choose your UFRAG password, right? It just gets created for you. Uh, Right, but you could, yeah. I mean, you could say that it was in some way related to something else about the session that you already kind of knew. Um, uh, I don't think it's. I mean, I, so so I don't think it's in unsolvable, and I don't think that it's totally out of scope for WebRTC NV. Um, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, I mean, we could create, uh, look at this a little bit more and create a privacy-oriented use case for WebRTC, which would get at, um, you know, maybe there's some potential privacy improvements overall. I think this is uh, for, for censorship circumvention. Uh, it's possible, of course, to do both. We could have a web transport use case and a WebRTC NV use case for this same kind of thing. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the sensitivity is that kind of whether you see any peer to peer game in town for this at the moment. So it's kind of um, the moment you remove it from the WebRTC use cases list, you're saying it's client, you're happy to make it client server. And that's like, you know, maybe that's the right decision, but I, I personally don't feel that way. Uh, so Tim, to, to be maybe more explicit, you, you do have a use case for this in a peer-to-peer -peer setup. For a VPN, peer-to-peer -peer VPN? Sure. Um, I mean, VPN-like um, behaviors. I'm kind of conscious that I'm in the W3C world here, so I'm going to be a t tiny bit careful here. But I think I presented at TPAC the idea that you could uh, load um, pages from a device, a device behind NAT, say a camera or something. Um, you could load pages, Web, uh, WebOTC containing, over WebOTC, you can load a page kind of VPN-like into your um, your browser without being dependent, that page never being dependent on the server. So that's a peer-to-peer. -peer, it isn't exactly uh, a VPN, but it's VPN-like yeah, that's behavior. A, well, that, that was the meshed case that Peter talked about, not, yeah, I um, guess I'm, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't have to be a mesh. It can be literally one-to-one. -one. Hmm. I mean, I do this all the time. So, I mean, I think it would actually be useful to document it as part of this uh, issue 51 yeah. discussion. Okay. Uh, because uh, I think the particular one that raised this issue, I think, uh, as Bana identified, it's probably a better fit in a, Client server model, but if indeed there are applications of this in peer to peer, then there may be value in uh, having part of yeah. this shipped to web transport, but also part of this uh, considered for web RTC. Itself. Yeah, yeah, kind of looking at this issue more, it's it's kind of saying two things at once. It's talking about Tor Snowflake, and then it's also talking about VPN. Those are very different things, I think. Uh, the overall goal is is privacy and censorship circumvention, but uh, maybe we should split these things apart. Uh, okay, so I think the the uh, overall guidance seems to be try to try to keep and develop this in WebRTC and V uh, use cases. Try to figure out what the core of it is for that, and also potentially, I guess, privacy could be of interest to Web Transport as well. Um, so it can it can go to both places, I guess. Um, the last one is uh, an IoT security camera use case um, where they were, um, it, it includes two things, I guess, uh, a situation where uh, they, I guess they want some kind of partial reliability where they uh, don't want to, don't retransmit if uh, your latency is too high and the second was uh, upload a video, which is uh, something that is done by WebRTC actually pretty frequently. Uh, it's used for video upload. Um, and this is a case where they, but they don't want any, they want zero loss. Um, so uh, item one, uh, I guess you, you can do retransmission and set RTX time SDP parameter so you can get the partial reliability. So I'm not sure that this is something that's impossible with whoever to see today. Uh, and then item two, if you really want uh, no loss at all, that seems like a, uh, uh, something that web transport might be uh, best suited for. So you can use like a reliable stream and, and get your video upload that way. Um, and uh, this is something that's pretty popular is the video ingestion case. Uh, but again, it doesn't seem like forcing ICE over TCP is the right way to to get this kind of lossless behavior. Um, um, I mean, you could do all uh, you could do most of this in WebRTC anyway. I mean, right? It you, is done in WebRTC. Both of these things, yeah. Um, so, what's the goal here? Is 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 to write a Use case. I mean, well, to understand the core core of this, I uh, 
as an example, um, there is a lot of IET, IoT usage of both WebRTC and potentially web transport. Uh, you know, the security camera case is quite real. Mm. Um, and the question is how to do this, how to do this better or, or what is actually required for that. Um, but to clarify, when you say lossless mode, I mean, they could already be using data channel, which is lossless. So they're, here they're talking about, I assume, using the native video RTP stack and losing the real-time part of WebRTC, so to speak. Well, now that's a great question, Yanivar, because they could they could do this. If you really want no loss, you could use reliable data channel. Right. Does, uh, uh, does WebCast fact, already cover, you know, controlling uh, controlling which transport the peer connection uses or is that separate it's client server right so it's 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 a client server thing so it's separate but uh with respect to two the lossless mode i mean actually web transport looks a lot like data channel except minus the ice um from that respect it's they would use the reliable transport mode of both um, in fact i'm I haven't heard of a video camera using security camera using data channel, but it wouldn't be a bad choice necessarily for this use case. Well, and you get get the benefit of getting um, like transport CC as well in that. So unless there's some <clears throat> commonality between real time video and non real time video, that's different from you know a file, I guess. Uh, there shouldn't necessarily, I don't know what the benefit would be of a lossless mode. And I, I worry we would run into, uh, you know, it's, it seems like a non real time use case that might challenge our APIs and potentially right. cause a lot of uh, change to it. Yeah. Yeah, I understand why a security camera might want to make sure there's no loss, you know, if somebody's robbing your store or something. Sure. Yes. Uh, but it's it's definitely it's definitely not real time because you'd want to retransmit till the cows come home <laughs> to make sure you caught the jewelry thief or whatever it was. Yes. And when you say upload, I guess it's assumed to be to a server. Yeah, for you know the security, the recorder. Or it could also yeah, be a peer-to-peer -peer endpoint. Yeah, I, commonly they are though, because what you want is to put the server you. Like it's not probably not a cloud server, and it probably doesn't have a public IP address. Right. So, so what if you just use the media recorder and then send the actual recordings as files? Well, that's the other criticism. Is this? Yes, you could, but it would hardly be performant. I guess. It's yeah. Another mm -hmm. reason for this use case. So, what do people think we should? do with this one. Uh, it does seem like it probably ought to be referred to web transport because it has some aspects of that. Um, is there anything really for WebRTC here? Is there something WebRTC can't do that this needs? Uh, I'd kind of be interested in talking to whoever brought this up to see whether there's, like, as you say, whether there's a piece of WebRTC that's still in Something that WebRTC could do better to meet this use case, because you say it's a common use case and interesting, um, mm. but but whether um, whether there's anything to do isn't totally obvious. Yeah, it's uh, Sean was submitted this. Uh, right. Okay, so we'll. Uh, I guess the action item was uh, refer this to Web Transport and also. Uh, try to see if there's a use case that should be in WebRTC NB that would require WebRTC improvement. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. All right, so um, we've gone over a bunch of the web, web trans, uh, of the NB use cases as it exists today, and we talked a little bit about some of the potential web transport use cases. I'd like to have an open-ended question for the working group, which is, have we missed anything here? Um, and the reason I ask this question is because We've seen an enormous amount of increase in usage in WebRTC since the pandemic started. Uh, and I've been keeping a little scrapbook on the kind of stuff that's being done out there. And it really is uh, kind of collectively, when you when you look at it, it's an amazing amount of new use cases, which uh, at least I hadn't thought of. Um, 
So I'd just like to show you a few of the things uh, in my scrapbook. Um, and uh, the first is relatively obvious. Uh, a lot of the conferences people used to go to are now virtual and online. Uh, this is an example of one from Enterprise Connect, uh, which is basically a, a conference about enterprise use of uh, communications. And that itself has gone online um, and uh, will occur uh, completely in an online mode. Um, second one is uh, the art world. Um, this is a very big convention, occurs a couple of times a year. It's called Art Basel. Uh, it's one of the largest art shows in the world. This is the 2019 version in Miami Beach, which was held in person uh, and most certainly will not occur again, at least in 2020. Um, this is one big convention center and there are probably 100,000 people uh, that are in there at once. Um, so here's a few things from that, uh, from 2019 uh, that were interesting. A big, um, there was something called virtual windows and the idea here is you basically, I don't, I don't know why you want to do that. Um, say you uh, have a house and you replace the window with an LCD screen. And then you have you could have scenes from anywhere in the world. Uh, and in this particular case, it's, this is actually not a photograph. It's, it's actually live video. Or, sorry, it's video. It's not, it's not live. Uh, but this is uh, Jerusalem uh, at the Wailing Wall. Uh, and you basically would have a window in your house, and I guess you'd look at it and think you're in Jerusalem. Uh, if you're more interested in Italy, they had a window uh, that was, I guess, a mall in Milan uh, as well. So in 2020, uh, they won't be having this show, and they've been doing it online. And the big question is whether this would actually work because they sell extremely high-priced artwork but apparently somebody bought a multi-million dollar sculpture. Uh, and uh, so you can actually attend this show uh, yeah, completely online and spend your life savings on a painting or something. Uh, but it apparently works. Um, this year, at least the Democratic National Convention will be all virtual. And I'm not sure exactly what they're planning to do, uh, but um, I think it'll be a fairly, I think they're interested in a fairly substantial production. So that it's not going to look like, uh, you know, people in their houses and stuff like that. They're, they're thinking of doing something fairly elaborate. Um, not sure how you do that with a couple of thousand delegates and all of that, uh, but they're, they're planning for it. Um, We've also seen a lot of other very large virtual events. I got an invitation yesterday for something called a National Town Hall, where they were planning on having upwards of 10,000 people in a meeting. And this is another example of this. There's a homelessness conference that occurs every year, and it'll, it's going to go virtual. And I think they're planning to have uh, several thousand people in it at once. Uh, so uh, maybe something like a political convention, but even larger. Um, as you may know, uh, many of the biggest movie theaters are going, uh, potentially declaring bankruptcy. And this is a virtual movie theater application where you get to watch a movie with your friends. So it's kind of a combination of streaming and, uh, and a chat. Uh, I guess at this this one is uh, uh, the key thing here is that it's not it doesn't require low latency streaming. The streaming itself can be high latency, but I guess it has to be everyone has to see the same thing more or less at the same time. Uh, uh, the sports teams uh, are not allowed to generally to play in stadiums around the world. Um, and so a lot of the teams are trying weird, weird things. Uh, I just got an email today about baseball games where they want the audience to be online and clap or applaud or do the usual things they do during the game. And they'll pipe that into the stadium, which is empty. <laughs> um, and then there are other 
uh, maybe on, I don't know if they're if they'll try to pipe that into the broadcast. Um, but also, the NHL and Disney are creating an interactive tool, uh, I guess, to help people better experience the game while it's going on. I'm not sure if if the goal is to watch it through the tool or to somehow interact with the game. Um, so anyway, sports as we know it, large large sports is being remade uh, with a combination of of conferencing and streaming. Um, a number of uh, theater companies that I belong to have canceled their seasons, but a few have tried to uh, continue on. And one of them, it's a little theater company in Tacoma, has gone entirely virtual. So they're, they're starting to sell tickets to these virtual performances. This was a performance of Robin Hood, which they I think they did over Zoom, and it was uploaded to YouTube. You can actually watch it on YouTube. And you can see that they're setting the scenery using custom backgrounds. Um, and so I guess a bunch of them are in a, some kind of castle. Um, and so they did this live. So you would actually buy a ticket and, and come on and watch this. And then you could uh, see it after the fact. It, so it was kind of a combination of, a, of YouTube streaming, I guess, and uh, some, an RTC to create the performance. Uh, and there are a number of requirements, like people are constantly entering and exiting the scenes, so you can't you can't have a delay when you enter the conference or leave it. Uh, we're seeing a huge amount of television being produced now at home. Um, what's interesting about this one is it's actually people's homes. They're not using custom backgrounds. I'm not sure why not. <laughs> uh, but this is Saturday Night at, uh, Live at Home. You may have seen this. Um, people get on and they do their skits. Um, through through conferencing, and this is a show. Uh, it's called Full, Full Frontal. You may have seen it. It's uh, a husband and wife team. They're off in the woods, and the husband, I guess, is a has experience producing and uh, editing television. Uh, and that's Samantha B. Um, this one, they do bring in guests over RTC and kind of edit this all into a production they send up. Uh, and the, and it's pretty it's pretty well done. If you watch it, some cases you might not know that it was uh, done at home as opposed to out of the studio because they have all their all their equipment and lighting and all that stuff uh, at home. Another uh, industry that's been impacted is the music industry. Uh, most large concerts have been canceled. Who knows when we'll have those again? Um, so a lot of them have gone online. Most of them, as far as I know, are kind of small. Uh, they're done, produced at home. Like I think Garth Brooks had a concert he produced. It was seen by a large number of people at drive-in movie theaters. So it, he recorded at home and did. Uh, people were able to watch it in the drive-in in their cars. Uh, but others, um, you know, I've heard of some other concerts that are looking at kind of mixed streaming and try to have higher production values, uh, and also go out to potentially a large number of people. Um, virtual travel, um, since we can't go anywhere, uh, might be interesting to be able to virtually travel. I'm not sure I want necessarily an experience where I sit on a plane and have that part of it, but uh, there are all kinds of uh, virtual reality experiences, digital exhibits, uh, museums, some museums have gone online, um, and you can go in and explore. As far as I know, I think this is might be more of a web VR kind of a thing, uh, but maybe there is some. I've seen some elements where actually the uh, it's uh, it's a combination of WebRTC and and uh, some like a. Whatever to see is used, for example, to render a 3D scene out to a conference, things like that. Um, so I guess my question is, you know, uh, have we been thinking too narrowly in Weber C NV use cases? You know, the NV use cases were the kind of things we we were thinking of doing three months ago, and the world seems to have moved um, at a very rapid pace. Uh, so just something for things people to think about 
you know, are, are all of these kind of things we're seeing now, are they all possible through whoever it's CNV use cases and the web transport use cases? Or is there there's something where we don't quite have have down yet? Seems like a greater need for like optimization and, and scaling. But it's, right. it all sounds pretty much the same, uh, generally speaking. Yeah, the scale is in some cases much, much larger than we'd usually be thinking. I mean, for some of these things, uh, I guess the political convention is in the thousands. The, the na nationwide town hall begins to sound like something uh, you know, in the tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands. All right. So Bernard, with, with Millicast, we're we're doing today the UNO meeting in, in Europe that is hosted by France. Those are much bigger audiences than that. All right. Even for small audience on Millicast, which is a one too many broadcast design, right? Uh, the auction houses, for example, do 71 auction in parallel over 10 hours with each around 50,000 viewers in parallel. So this, mm. this is the order that you can expect. And when we speak to TV in the US, they say, uh, start at 2 million and go up. Show me you can do 2 million concurrent viewer for a single source, then we can speak. Are any of those interactive? So is it 2 million people with them? Or just two million viewers, or two million people potentially interacting. That's no, that's uh, one too many. So that's two million concurrent okay. viewers, right? That concurrent that's, viewers, yeah. And uh, you can have a feedback loop with a uh, with a happy few. So that's the TV host, for example. We have a TV company that do that. The live show, uh, the midnight live show, where you have a TV host, let's say four to five guests. Um, and then you have an audience, but at any given time, you want uh, anybody in the audience to be able to actually come on, on stage and interact with the TV host or the guest. Mm. So usually the uh, interactive uh, people are a uh, maximum 12. The audience is up to 2 million, and you should have the capacity for anybody in the audience to raise their hand or grab the mic or do something and become, uh, right. become active but a certain number at a time, a token system. But the numbers are, have gone much higher. I feel like there are a couple of themes in there, one of which is, is um, asymmetry, that like kind of, you know, all of the things that you're talking about are, are asymmetric media, essentially, um, potentially dynamically asymmetric. And I think maybe we haven't like quite paid enough attention to that in, in the past. Yeah. And I think the other thing is, it feels like a lot of what you're talking about is crossover between web OTC and web transport. Yes. And, 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 and there's a sort of, like we're almost drawing a hard line and it would be good to have, you know, some clear ways to join the two together. I totally yeah. agree with the team there. I feel like there is a demand to reduce the gap between the traditional traditional media streaming and, and, and web RTC. Uh, people expect to have the 10 bits HDR things they're getting in Netflix that they can play in Chrome over web RTC and uh, that develop quality is not in the real time encoder. Um, and, and there are other few things like that where um, having the same media stack for both if it wasn't for the, the real time, the latency section of things. Uh, is really something that is being asked among other stuff. Yeah, I think I, an, yeah. Go ahead. There's an aspect uh, that um, a lot of people folk, uh, try to mix is that if you have low latency, you probably have synchronized delivery. But synchronized delivery, I think, is a quality that could be aimed for in a different way than with lower latency. Maybe a long buffer, but with a global clock and making sure you have uh, synchronized delivery, for example, for sports events or things like that. But I don't think that's something we can do right now. Um, you have a, you have some people like you have Phoenix RTS that have a synchronized delivery. There is DACast also in Europe that, that does that. But the problem is to do synchronized delivery is the weakest, weakest link, right? Since you cannot accelerate people, 
you need to slow down everybody to the slowest member to make sure that everybody gets the frame. So if there is a regulation behind that, for example, for gambling, to make sure that everybody get the same chance, uh, that's fine. But otherwise, uh, for live event, for sport, people always want to get the fastest access they can. They don't want that if there is one viewer uh, connecting from a, a crappy Wi-Fi or a slow connection, then it slows everybody else down to be able to have a, a synchronized delivery. Well, you, you could say that you have a 10 second latency over the real time event and then making sure that everyone is receiving the frames at the same is playing the frames at the same time um, with whatever buffering strategy they want uh, for their device to make sure that your neighbor is not screaming before you which is usually the use case that uh, right, but, I've but heard a sport broadcaster extra to get a lower latency and my neighbor is not, <laughs> you know, I don't want my system to slow down so so that my my neighbor doesn't hear my scream. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I talked about some people who, who care about that to have a proper synchronized uh, playing on all devices as uh, one of the quality of the service they offer, making sure that yeah, if you broadcast with an hour. You get that. So I think um, the point which we probably you have should a on the delivery, you will not be able to commit to everybody else, you know, slowing down for you. Yeah, I think the, the point uh, made here that we probably should be thinking about is the combination of these web transport and WebRTC scenarios, and make sure that you can do both. Because it seems like I do agree with the point that that there's combinations here uh, where. Potentially, both are being used in the same in the same application and the same potentially even the same video tag. Uh, anyway, we did get to the end. Uh, Stefan Hawkinson sent a bird picture um, uh, that he he's it's actually a pretty rare bird. I'll I'll leave it to you to figure out what it is. Uh, but we did get to the bird this time. Um, Ronald, if I, you let me just put a question to the working group on on the table before we go to the bird. Okay. Uh, I think one of the most pressing demand is related to the business model, right? Um, most of the people using WebRTC originally they have content that do not have value, so they're fine. Mm -hmm. Some people want to monetize with ad insertion that's doable, that's fine. And then some people have very, very high value content. Mm -hmm. And the first question is, what do you have for content protection? Do you have anything like DRM for WebRTC? Um, and, and today we don't. Even if end-to-end -end encryption would be a possibility because DRM is a mm -hmm. kind of end-to-end -end encryption. I think this is the problem that is not solved and that would um, gain value in being standardized. But I do not, I do not know. I don't think it should be WebRTC. I think we should try to unify what is done with the media secure extension. I don't remember the name, to be honest, uh, yeah. in the media group and in the WebRTC group. So it, would web transport be the right place for that kind of discussion? Or do other I people said, think that is an interesting problem and, and would like to well, participate in the discussion? Well, I think it, it, it if you're mixing because uh, a bunch of the scenarios we just described would have content protection, like some of the sports things. Uh, and if you're mixing them with a WebRTC component, then I think it is like, how do you do that if some of the elements, I guess some of the elements, some you would have separate video tags and some of them would be DRM and some of them not. But anyway, I think, um, I think that that will co inevitably come up, probably. Uh, is that a question that anybody else has on his radar or being asked about by by customer or, or developers? Uh, certainly, I've heard customer asks for it. Um, but it's kind of mixed. In some ways, it's mixed into the uh, uh, security model for uh, what we call end-to-end -end security. I've heard, for example, concerns about people recording uh, wherever you see and then using it to create digital fakes. So they want some ability to apply DRM to WebRTC content. Uh, Isn't there already a flag for, for saying you can't record this stream? 
Well, that would be a protected stream. Deleted yeah. stream. Yeah, protected streams. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is that only that flag is only listened to by browsers. If you have a, rec a recording, there's no uh, cryptographic protection for the for the stream. Right. So you'd need to combine it with cryptographic protection. Yeah. Right. Right. But if you put the two together, then maybe you'd come out with something quite strong. Right. Right. But it doesn't exist right now. Right, right. So, I mean, uh, you could come up with a solution based on end-to-end -end encryption, and it gives you a finer granularity than DRM. It's slightly different trust model, though. But if we go, if we go to a model where different transport of media can pipe in a video HTML5 element, like you kind of have today, you can transfer a data of a web socket or data channel and, and recompose the frame and, and play them or you have WebRTC, or you have MPEG-Dash, right? right? If you use MPEG-Dash, you have DRM. If you use Web WebSocket, uh, at best, you have secure WebSocket with a transport uh, layer security. If you use WebRTC, it's the same, but you do not have, without end-to-end -end encryption, WebSocket and WebRTC do not have the equivalent of DRM today, even right. though it, it all goes to the browser and is consumed by a video element. So what I'd like to do is to ask people to, we've had some great thoughts here and discussions. I'd like to ask you to take it to the next level and file issues, specifically on some of these use cases that we've discussed that maybe aren't in the document. Um, and so we can move that forward um, in WebRTC CNV. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.